So, hi, my name is Elizabeth Petraglia. Um, I'm a statistician um, working at a company called Westat. We're based in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and I'm excited to present today, you know, virtually rather than in person, on research that I've been working on with my colleagues, Adele Polson and Wei Jiren. Um, so we've been looking at findings from the National Digital Check Form, the first year of data, um, and I'm excited to share some of what we found with you. Before I get started, I would like to give a big thank you to a lot of other people without whom this research would not have been possible. Um, it includes Amy Artuso, um, Jennifer from the NDCF training, Julie and Joe from Tennessee Tech, and also the NCPSB board. They've all been just an invaluable resource through this process, being very, very patient with our questions and um, giving us a lot of support through the process. So I'd like to thank all of them. Um, I'd also like to give a huge thank you to all the CPSCs who are who have been out there using the digital check form. Um, I'm not a tech myself, but I am certainly in awe of all the work that you do. I've seen my colleagues who are techs recording seat check info while wedged into some weird position in the backseat of a tiny car in the heat, in the cold, in the rain. So um, a huge thank you to all the techs who contributed to this and are really making all of this possible too. So a quick outline of my talk, um, I'm going to start with a little background on the NDCF for anyone who's not quite familiar with it. Um, and then I'm going to jump into describing what we're calling the year one data set, um, giving some descriptive information on the data, some information about preliminary misuse rates, um, and then kind of a summary of what we've done so far and the future work that we hope to be able to do. So first, for just a little background on the NDCF, um, there are about 43,000 certified techs in the US. And historically, um, all car seat checks have been documented using paper forms, which is great to have this data, but it can be very time consuming to extract data or trends from paper. You know, If you have a stack of paper forms, there's no easy way to just look at that stack and see what the misuse rate was over like the past month, for example. So the NDCF was developed in part to address this and also to take, take advantage of some of the other benefits of online data collection. So it's a free resource for all currently certified techs. There are web-based or mobile versions available, plus a backup paper form. So you can use the paper form. The apps are also designed to work even without internet access and information can be uploaded later. The NDCF is designed to help streamline the inspection process too by automatically skipping items that aren't relevant. So if you're checking a booster seat, it will automatically skip all the harness related questions. It has built in links to useful information. So it will provide recall info at the correct time. So instead of you know having to go separately look it up, it's right there. Um, and because all the data collected through the NDCF use a consistent set of questions, it's becomes easier to compare data across programs and across time. And so um, the most exciting part for kind of a statistician and data nerd like me is that all the data collected is available in real time. So techs, programs, state coordinators, um, even car seat and vehicle manufacturers can just go online, download an Excel file, and look at everything in real time. So you can look at um, trends in your programs, um, you manufacturers can look at you know which types of misuse or moats common for their particular seats. So this is um, a really unique um, and innovative system with a lot of potential for allowing much more data-driven decisions on things like program development, outreach efforts, and um, product design. So given my time limit, I'm not going to spend a lot more time talking about the NDCF, but I did want to provide some information for people who are. Um, interested in learning more. So at carseatcheckform.org, there's a ton of useful information. Um, there are email addresses if you have any questions, how-to guides and videos. So, you know, it's, it's all there. So please um, take a look if you're interested. So now we get to get into, again, what's the most exciting part for me, um, the data. So as a starting point, we kind of took what we're calling the year one cut of the data. So we started at August 1st, 2018, which is sort of the first date that the NDCF was rolled out. 
And then we picked a cutoff date of September 30th, 2019 for the initial file. So we needed to pick a cut date. So we kind of had a fixed, you know, this is the data. We don't have new data coming in as we're trying to clean it. This data file had um, a little over 13,500 records. And when I'm talking about a record, it's at the child car seat level. So if you have a vehicle that comes in with three kids, that ends up being three separate records in the data for each child or seat that's checked. Um, but they all have the same check ID, so you can link them back to the same record. Um, and just to kind of emphasize how amazing I think all of you techs are, um, while I was cleaning the data, I noticed that there was one vehicle that looked like it had 10 checks associated with it. My first thought was, this absolutely can't be right. There's no way anyone's checking 10 seats in the same vehicle. Um, and sure enough, I went and looked and it looked like there was some, you know, really dedicated team of techs who managed to check basically a fully loaded 14 passenger van. So these are, um, you know, while I'm reporting on kind of overall trends and things like that right now, these are the kind of really cool details that you can find um, in the data that are also, um, interesting as well. So in total, we have a little over 11,000 vehicles in this first um, data set. And one last thing that I want to mention to anyone who's currently working with NDCF data is that we found um, about 300 records in the data that were um, training records or otherwise kind of like test demo, you know, bad records that you don't want to keep in the data. And some of them are, were actually flagged as training, but others took a lot more work to find. You know, you'd go through a whole record and then you'd see in the documentation box, someone wrote, oh, this is a training record or please delete or test record or something like that. So just something to be aware of if you're working through the data file at the moment, um, make sure to check those kinds of things. <laughs> And um, so speaking of our um, super techs, we also have some NDCF super users out there, which you can kind of see from this map. So this map shows the number of checks recorded in the NDCF by the state of the event. Um, and the darker red corresponds to states with more checks. So of the about 13,500 checks we have in this year one data set, um, about 7,500 of them are from Indiana alone. So Indiana, you guys are doing great. Um, Colorado also has about 2,000 records. Vermont has a little over 1,000. Um, Maryland has a little over 500. So most of the checks in the data set that I'm describing today come from those four states. However, this comes with the caveat that we know that since we kind of did our cutoff in September 2019, the NDCF is being much more widely used. And most of these states that are in these really light colors with few checks right now will have much more by the time we kind of do our, you know, hopefully year two work. So this is changing. I just want to make sure that it's clear, you know, the data I'm presenting today that I have available today, these are the states where it's coming from. If I get the chance to give an update, hopefully in person next year, hopefully we'll see a map with a lot more darker colors and nearly all states with some data. So like I said, while I'm presenting these results, it's important to keep in mind that um, the results are only from the data that we have in the NDCF year one. So we're not representing all states in the US at this point. We have lots of data from our power users, but are not representing some states. The other thing I want to make sure to be clear is that um, this is our preliminary cleaning only. So, you know, we're kind of 90, 95% of the way through having a clean final data set. Um, that said, I am giving some numbers in the next few slides. The exact numbers might change a little bit in our final clean data set, but the general trends won't. So the trends, overall trends are set. Um, but we might still be adjusting a few cases as we finalize our data cleaning. So first, what kinds of seats are coming into these checks? Um, so you can see, um, and experienced techs are probably not surprised at all to see this, that most of the seats coming into these checks are rear facing only seats. So we've got about 47% of the seats checked are rear facing only seats. And then it drops off pretty dramatically when you're looking at, you know, 
the boosters and the seat belts only for the older kids. Um, we've also got about 20% of checks that are being done um, with no car seat on arrival. Um, so the other category with those 27 cases, those are um, medical seats, specialized restraints, um, vests, things like that. So the other thing we wanted to look at are what are the ages of children coming to these checks? And this um, graph is pretty consistent with the previous slide in that most of the checks we're seeing are on these children that are either, you know, the infants under one year old or unborn children. And then it drops off again really dramatically after that. Um, the other thing I was able to look at with this data is how often was the child present? And so you can see that the purple part of the bar, you know, obviously unborn, no child available. But for the other bars, um, the purple part of the bar shows the percentage of time which the child was present. And we can see that actually in the checks we have in the NDCF, the child is present most of the time. So for about two thirds of the checks that we have in our data set, the child is there. And it actually looks like um, as the child gets older, the child is there um, more often. How are these seats installed on arrival? So um, we looked at kind of the distribution of ways they were installed. So again, maybe not surprisingly, because we have all these checks um, for children who are unborn, um, a lot of the seats are coming in uninstalled. So about 30% of the checks we're looking at, the seats are coming in uninstalled um, and they're asking the techs to install them. So for the other seats, we've got about 30% installed with the seat belt only, 31% installed with the lower anchors only. So again, like a pretty even split there. We're seeing about 6% of seats come in installed with the seat belt and the lower anchors. Um, and then we've got this small other or unknown category where either the data weren't recorded clearly enough for us to kind of tell what the installation method was or the tech marked other. Um, and this breakdown includes about 2,700 seats, um, 2,700 checks that are with no CRS on arrival. So uninstalled does not include the cases where there was no car seat at all. It really is, there was a car seat, but it was uninstalled. And note that the seatbelt only category is, is including any child who showed up wearing a seatbelt only. So it's not just the car seats, it's also children who showed up wearing a seatbelt. The other um, thing, because it's you know kind of a hot topic, is um, looking at top tether usage. So how often with seats that have a top tether available, how often is that top tether being used? So if we looked at only um, forward facing seats with a harness, which should be the ones with the top tether. Um, we saw that only about 28% of those seats came in using the top tether. So obviously that's um, lower than we'd like to see, but still kind of interesting to see the trend in the data. So um, this slide is kind of short, but it actually represents a lot of the work we've done um, in the data cleaning. So if you can imagine um, the car seat manufacturers and the vehicle manufacturers are open text fields um, in the in the form. So, um, you know, to type in a vehicle name or a car seat name or, um, you know, anything you have to enter on a tiny screen while you're probably in the backseat of a car um, is, is difficult to do. And there are different spellings and there are typos and um, a lot of things that needed to get cleaned up so we could kind of um, generate these frequencies. So after a ton of cleaning and our um, awesome research assistant spending hours probably wanting to pull her hair out, we were finally able to get a manufacturer, um, clean manufacturer for each seat and a um, vehicle manufacturer for each vehicle. So when we did that, um, we kind of found, you know, what are some of the bigger car seat manufacturers in the data? So some of the bigger manufacturers like Graco, Evenflow, Kiko already have um, 
you know, over a thousand, and in the case of Graco, about 3,400 records in the data set. So there's, you know, again, this is year one data, it's going to continue to grow, but there are already thousands of records out there for some of these more popular manufacturers. Same thing with the vehicle manufacturers. Um, once we kind of got the data cleaned, and again, I'm giving an approximate number here because we're sort of still going through the cleaning process with a few of the trickier records. Um, some of the more popular vehicle manufacturers already have between one and 2,000 records. So again, and this is going to continue to grow and grow as we get more data, hopefully. So this amount of data should allow manufacturers who are interested to look at some of the trends in the data and see how some of these features are being used in the real world or misused and potentially, hopefully, informing future design decisions. So now we kind of get to the um, kind of more exciting part, you know, instead of just descriptive statistics, let's actually look at some misuse rates. So the first thing we looked at was harness misuse. So if we're only looking at seats with a harness, um, what, you know, what types of misuse are we seeing and how much misuse are we seeing? So overall, we see a harness misuse rate of about 19% of all seats that are coming in with a harness. Um, and these harness errors include the harness being twisted, the harness too loose, not clipped, chest clip not clipped, chest clip at wrong level, harness in wrong slot, buckle errors, um, harness damaged, harness altered, or anything else um, harness related you can think of. You can see the rate is, the misuse rate is different by seat type. So for um, forward facing seats with a harness, the misuse rate is about 32%. Um, for the rear-facing convertible or rear-facing with a base, it's a bit lower, so it's um, 14 to 19 percent for those two. So the rear-facing without base rate um, is also pretty high at um, just over 40 percent, but um, I do want to point out that, that, that we don't see a ton of checks with those seats, so that's kind of a smaller group than the other ones. Um, of looking at the most common harness errors we're seeing in the state of the most common error, um, which again may not be surprising, is um, a harness that's too loose, followed by having the harness in the wrong slot, and then finally having the chest clip at the wrong height. So now we're going to switch to looking at installation errors. So specifically installing a car seat using the seat belt. So this excludes you know, children who come in just wearing a seat belt because it's not an installation. So we're only looking at seats being installed with um, the seat belt. So when a seat belt was used for installation, the misuse rate, misuse rate was nearly 60%. So the misuse rates were lower with boosters. So if you look at the belt positioning booster um, bar, it's second from the left, you can see it's about 41%. And these are mostly routing and fit errors. So the other, you know, you can see the trend in the other seats is um, pretty high, you know, 60% or above. So the most common errors we see with the seat belt installation is again, just that the seat belt is too loose. We also see a lot of retractor errors. So that's either the retractor being engaged when it shouldn't be or not being engaged when it should. Um, and then also we see this group of seats that are installed with the seat belt and the lower anchors. Finally, I'm going to look at, um, we're going to look at lower anchor installation misuse. So this misuse rate is a little lower at about 45%. Um, so this plot is only showing the four most common car seats um, where lower anchors are used for the installation. So again, we see the misuse rate is actually a little higher for forward facing seats. It's about 54% and a little lower for installing the base only for a rear facing seat with base. Um, again, we kind of see the same theme. The most common error by far is just having the installation be too loose, um, followed by using the lower anchor with the seat belt. And then the third most common category is um, incorrect use of vehicle anchors, which includes things like borrowing lower anchors from other seating positions. Um, and this actually kind of feeds in nicely to um, Julie's talk, um, because 
part of her, you know, part of her research is all about, um, you know, using those more widely spaced lower anchors. So we can see it's pretty common in the data, um, and she's going to give you more information about kind of the impacts of some of this. So to summarize, um, a lot of the trends we're seeing in the year one data are, are sort of as expected. So they seem to follow the same patterns that in talking to my colleagues who are techs, you know, they're saying these are the things that we're seeing. We're seeing lots of infant checks. We're seeing fewer older children. Um, everything's always too loose. Harness is too loose. Installation is too loose. Um, so, you know, kind of from a does this make sense point of view, the NDCF data seems to be reflecting what's actually being observed out there in the field. It's important to remember that these data, again, only represent checks recorded as of September 30th, 2019. So we know there's already more data in there. And the more checks um, that are recorded, the better data we'll be able to have. So um, our data set will continue to grow. And again, I want to say thank you to everybody who's using it and contributing to it, because every contribution to this effort will make more interesting and exciting um, analysis and data you know, going forward. So if you are not an NDCF user and would like to know more, um, again, I have all the resources for that on slide five. Just a quick summary of our future work. So this year, we were just doing baseline cleaning and analysis. We are planning um, to make the clean data set available for users. So all of our hard work in getting the data really clean and user friendly, um, you know, that should be available for users soon. Um, we're also going to provide some data visualizations, graphics, um, ways to kind of easily understand the information that's in this data set. Moving forward to what we're sort of calling year two, so sort of the next step, we want to do some more sophisticated and detailed analyses, including um, hopefully being able to weight by census data to produce some analyses that are weighted by population, so reflect not just the population coming to checks, but are, you know, we can say after waiting, they're representative of the population of, of children as a whole. So thank you all for, um, you know, I guess tuning in virtually um, because this was not in person and because there was no opportunity to ask questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. My um, email address is there um, and I am happy to, you know, answer any questions or talk further about any of this research. Thank you very much.